So my name is Matt Palakdiri. I'm the Vice President of Strategy at Tealbook. And today we have a very special guest. We have Chris Sawchuk, the principal at the Hackett Group. And this is a really exciting presentation today. And Chris has insight from his global procurement advisory practice that he leads at Hackett, working with companies around the globe. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Matt. And, uh, you know, welcome, everyone. You know, it was about a I think uh, uh, several weeks ago when Matt and Stephanie had reached out to, um, you know, put this series of webcasts together, um, you know, in the current environment. And, you know, I, one of the things they asked me to do is, you know, talk about the current state. And so what I really want to try to talk about today is, you know, not only the current state of our data as organizations, and, and, and one of the ways I'm going to be doing that is to leverage some of the insights that we accumulated through our 2020 key issue study uh, most recently and, and a couple of other studies as well. But one of the things I want to leave you with is some insights on that top of mind issue that we're all thinking about today and are all, you know, not only our companies, but personally being impacted on, and that is the crisis. Some of the things that we're learning from other companies. You know, last week when, when Steph talked about, you know, and, and kicked off this whole series of webcasts, she highlighted several things. You know, one of the things she highlighted was, you know, the current issues that companies are having with data. But the other thing that she blended in was this whole focus on talent. And, you know, if we're going to do this right, we need to actually get our talent right as well. But the thing that I thought she did a really good job was, is this idea of this house analogy that she talked about. And if we're going to build a house in our organizations and using this as an analogy, we have to have a good foundation. And the foundation is the data that we have for our organizations. So if we go to the next slide here, from an enterprise perspective, and when I talk about enterprise, what I'm referring to is the general administrative, basically finance, IT, HR, sourcing and procurement, a bit of supply chain, global business services. This is how we define the enterprise from a Hackett vernacular. But there's a couple of things that I wanted to highlight as we start down this, this path and talking about this story of the current state and data in particular. You know, one of the things that we saw in our study this year from an overall enterprise perspective, and I think it was a great thing, is that, you know, you know we saw two, a couple of different things. So one was the fact that data and information are areas of high priority from a development standpoint, when we look at all of these different functions out there. But more importantly, was that we recognize, and we recognize the foundational role that data management plays in the successful digital transformation of our organizations. You know, one of the things I'll point out is that these two different percentages that I highlight here, you know, one is that 47% of organizations reported having major initiatives underway for data management and analytical capability improvement. Whereas only 40% are having, you know, have, uh, uh, you know, initiatives underway to transform their organizations using digital technologies. And what this really highlighting to us is that we're putting forth and we're finally understanding the importance of getting our data right as we go forward with some of the digital transformation within our organizations. So what I want to do now is really look a little bit more specifically at procurement. I want to just highlight the whole focus on the transformational progress that we're making, but more specifically, the, the hurdles that are, you know, in some ways just hampering our, our, our desire to move forward in some of the transformational efforts that we have underway. You know, I just highlighted, you know, how data is key to digital transformation. So the real question then becomes is, you know, what are some of the issues that are holding up our digital transformation? And not surprisingly, data, data-related issues. You know, if we're going to go transform our organizations in procurement, you know, one of the key things that we've cited is that the, you know, is the data-related issues are having a, you know, causing us to, you know, uh, some significant issues in terms of moving forward with our transformational progress. But we're also highlighting people and the lack of, you know, skills in some cases for the people to engage with the data within our organizations. Years ago, 
you know, when we look at, you know, seven and eight on this slide, looking at inadequate funding and resource allocation and lack of commitment, you know, we saw these as the number one issue. So if we went back, you know, five years, these were the challenges, these were the hurdles we were dealing with in organizations to move forward with some of our transformational efforts. What we've seen that is shifted and it's shifted to data, it's shifted to talent. But the other point I wanna make is, you know, the fact that, you know, what we're seeing at number six is the focus on technology. And again, this reiterates the point that organizations see is that it's the data, it's even the talent and the people that we have to engage with that data that are our bigger hurdles than the technology itself. It's foundational. So if we're gonna look at that and we're gonna understand, and we do understand that data and people are some of the areas that are hindering our progression forward in some of our digital transformation efforts, what is it about the people? What's happening there? And so what this slide actually shows is that as we look at our organizations in procurement, you know, what are the gaps? And what we did is we highlighted several different areas of competencies, everything from analytics and modeling to data, uh, and you can see the rest of them here, business acumen, customer focus, creativity, and innovation. But the two number one, analytics and modeling and data, the biggest gaps, 86 to 85% of organizations in terms of where they are today, state that where they are today, there are gaps to where they need to be from a skill standpoint within their talent, within their organizations. It's not just about you know, the, the benefits. And what we're looking at here are some of the benefits that we're seeing from digital transformation. You know, one of the things when we look at the benefits and we went out in a study, we asked the organization, what do you think are some of the, you know, the benefits that you're going to get from digital transformation? Number one, improving data to support decision making. You know, one of the things I like to say, it's not just about the data going in, but it's actually the data coming out. Data gets transformed in digital transformation. But for us to enable our digital transformation efforts, we need good data. And so organizations are highlighting the fact that, you know, having improved data is key to one of the benefits that we can arrive at through the digital transformation efforts of our organization. The other thing are the steps that organizations are making, procurement organizations are making to enable some of the advanced analytics uh, within their organization. You know, more specifically, you know, one of the things that procurement organizations have said for a long time is that not only do they want to work with information that is sort of backward looking, but they want to be more predictive in the analytics uh, within their organization. And when we ask them, what are the steps that you're, you know, you're focusing on to actually you know, develop these advanced analytical capabilities within your organization? Again, it's around improving the data quality and not just the quality, but the accessibility to that data but also focusing on master data management. Key steps to enabling the advanced analytics of our organization. You know, one of the things that, you know, when you think about data, I, I, always, I used to always talk about the four V's of data. You know, volume, variety, veracity, as well as the velocity of the data. Now, when we think more specifically around master data, you know, one of the studies that we've done is we asked the question around, what are some of the problems that you're experiencing due to poor master data. And some of the areas that came across here was, you know, the first one around data trust. You know, just the integrity and, and, and just the debates that we're actually having in organizations about the data itself. Ineffective reporting, poor supplier relationships. But then we ask organizations the same question is, when you have quality master data, what are some of the benefits you expect from that? And what you see is a very much of a, an alignment between the two. Number one, data quality. Number two, accuracy. Both of these having to do to, you know, with the whole fact of trusting our data, which is really the biggest problem that we cited on the left-hand side. Decision-making. But also really important is this idea of having a single view of your supplier master. You know, too often we see organizations with multiple views and multiple supplier masters around the organization. And again, really emanating and you know, not necessarily having a single view or a single source of truth. So over time, we've had seen a transition when it comes to master data and how it is valued, 
how it's owned, how it's enabled, how it's optimized. But the first and key point here, and I like to say first and foremost, is that organizations are recognizing the strategic value and they're recognizing master data as a strategic corporate asset within the organization. This is key. You know, if you're going to go through and if you understand what I was saying before, if data is key to enabling our digital transformation of our organizations, and we understand that digital transformation is key to enabling our competitive success as a company, then we have to put value on the data itself and treat it as a corporate asset within our organizations. From an ownership standpoint, we're seeing organizations moving to more cross-functional ownership of data. We're also seeing technology and development and the development of information architectures and even having real-time integrations you know, within the data versus these batch updates that many organizations use today. We're also seeing an environment where we're looking at you know, the optimization of this data to enable some of the knowledge collaboration in our organizations, the ability to visualize data in a much different way than we have in the past. What I wanted to also share with you are some of the, I like to say, the essential master data best practices. One that I just highlighted is number one. And I like to look at these as, as, as more of takeaways for you. And as I already said, is you know, treating data as a strategic asset. But number two is the governing and controlling of the data itself. We have to create an environment that we continuously monitor our data for its accuracy, for its completeness, and I'll go back to the four Vs, you know, the volume, the veracity, the variety, and the velocity of our data. Number three, organization and stewardship. You know, as we look forward at some of the best practices here is having defined roles around the management of the data. Many organizations have created RACI models to understand who's going to be responsible and accountable, as well as consulted around these various roles in terms of the people that are focused on data stewards and owners of the data. Standard and data definitions, you know, coming up with definitions, you know, standard taxonomies, you know, standard taxonomies, not just to organize the data, but how are we gonna report it in a way that makes sense to the organization? Having consistent hierarchical views of the data. And then lastly, enablement. You know, really creating an environment where we have single master data reporting you know, a single master file, you know, enabling all of the systems that we have as an organization and delivering the high quality data that we need as a company. I've shared a number of different insights, and this is a very high, you know, view of, you know, just providing some initial insights into some of this information around data. You know, I hope you understand from here is that, you know, the point I was trying to make is that data, you know, with some of the, the insights that we got from our you know, key issue study that we performed at the tail end of last year is that the understanding, and I like to say it's the good news, is that we do recognize as organizations, and this has not always been the case, we haven't always seen this over the years, but the fact that data and, and the ensuing analytics that come after that is very foundational, and we're seeing organizations recognize it. It's foundational to our digital transformation, and they're starting to understand, you know, how they have to organize themselves around actually engaging with this master data and leveraging some of the best practices that I highlight at a very high level here on this particular slide. So with this, one of the things I said I would do next is to share some insights as well on the current crisis that we're seeing, you know, something that's you know, very much top of mind for all of us. And what I'd like to start with is this idea of the importance of the vendor master data in, in environments that we're in today. You know, a number of years ago, many of you probably remember, is that there was an earthquake in Japan. And as part of that earthquake, it created a tsunami. And, you know, many organizations were significantly impacted as a result of that. Supply chains were impacted. And, you know, one of the clients that we had was a, a company in the Midwest, uh, an industrial uh, manufacturer. And when this all happened, you know, the CEO knew that much of their supply chain uh, for some of the things they were building was in this area, you know, this particular area of Japan. And he asked his organization, he said, listen, you know, what suppliers 
were impacted because he knew that depending on the suppliers that were impacted, that's going to have a big impact on his ability to deliver to his customers, potentially could have a big impact on their revenue as a company. Three weeks later, that CEO got an answer from his team. Obviously, the CEO was not happy. And as a result of that, he, he, he shelled all efforts, all investments they were doing as a company and had the company focus on cleaning up their master data, not just their vendor master, their customer master, their item master across the organization. And today, that company is operating in a much more, I'll say, riskless and agile way than they were able to a number of years ago. Now, when we look at the short, mid-term, and long-term responses, one of the things that we're seeing today as we're talking to organizations, we're seeing right now that we're pretty much in this short-term period of time. And we really look at, you know, a period of time of two to three months that we will be responding, reacting, and managing the immediate impact of the current crisis on our staff, you know, basically the human aspects of this whole environment, the business operations of our companies, and the financial impacts. As we look further out, we start to digest and we get through the immediate impact. What I collect is called the sort of the midterm responses as organizations. And though it hasn't been proven yet, you know, the likelihood is that we will be in a recession when the numbers come out and the GDP numbers come out, you know, in, in, in the next, uh, you know, short amount of time in the second quarter. And as a result of that, many companies will be managing through an environment where they will be focusing more on things like cost. They'll be focusing on developing scenarios to plan and manage through this more recessionary environment. Now, we don't know how long that will take to go through that, but there is a long-term piece of this as well. And, you know, that potentially could be 12 months out. And it's really the post-crisis where we start reevaluating our supply chains. And I like to say is that what we're going to reevaluate is cost, risk, and agility, and reevaluate the priorities we put on all of these. You know, this has been a massive stress test, not only on our data, our digital transformations, us as individuals, companies, governments, globally, et cetera. And what I wanted to also share with you, some of the on-the-ground insights that we're getting back from clients. And these are just insights that we're getting. We're working with a lot of different companies right now and trying to understand what they're doing to respond and you know, not only deal with the human impact, the supply assurance impact, but also a number of organizations that are de- dealing with shocks to their demand. You know, and again, that, that demand shock can be either a positive or a negative uh, you know, in, in either case. And so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is a lot of collaboration. I would say more collaboration between supply chains or within supply chains than we've seen in, in, in a long, long time, if ever. And, you know, even to the point where we're seeing collaboration between competitors to deal with the current pandemic that is facing all of us. You know, more specifically, we see, you know, some easing in terms of the pay terms that organizations are utilizing with their suppliers. We've had a number of organizations in the pharma and med device uh, industries that have, you know, eased and and, and actually have gone to their, you know, mid and small suppliers to reduce their payment terms by 30 days. So if a supplier, you know, had a payment terms of 45 from this particular uh, customer, um, they're now, that customer is now paying them in 15 days. If it was 30 days, they're now paying them immediately. And so what we're seeing is this collaboration within the supply chain to help everyone out and to, you know, you know, really focus on the long-term viability of the entire supply chain itself. We're seeing a lot of relaxing around the buying channels and the policies, you know, really in the, in the effort to speed, you know, time to market, especially with some of the organizations that are focused on the vaccine, um, really focusing on velocity and trying to take any, any, any uh, impediments that would slow the process down out of the way. So we're seeing procurement do just Herculean tasks to remove these barriers to speed business in this period of time. We're also having companies talk about, 
you know, the fact that we're all working much more remotely in today's environment. You know, some are even, you know, having conversations already about the need for, you know, the amount of corporate real estate that they have today. And so we do see an impact on that, you know, looking forward. I've even had clients of mine who were in the, uh, in the uh, restaurant business, you know, send me deals uh, around uh, the food that they have, you know, offering all their suppliers and, and people they do work with, you know, deals on, on food and meals, et cetera. You know, one of the things that we're also seeing in some of the oil and gas industry and chemical industry is organizations that have been hit with hurricanes, uh, like in Houston, for example, you know, leveraging some of the hurricane plans that they've developed and, 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 and modifying them to deal with and turning into a pandemic uh, response plan. We're seeing organizations, you know, take on, you know, some of the freed up time to do other things within an organization. So if I'm in the oil and gas industry doing turnarounds on some of their plants and refineries uh, during this time, you know, to keep people employed, we're seeing organizations prioritize cost and starting to, we certainly, I, we believe we'll start seeing that as we move into the midterm, you know, responses, you know, prioritizing cost over process uh, improvements. We're seeing significant empowerment uh, within organizations across all the multiple tiers. Um, you know, one of the things is, is we're seeing the success of the companies, you know, because we're seeing sort of a dichotomy here in terms of companies that have been able to respond, you know, I'll say in better ways and some not as not as prepared in, in their response. And, and some of those that have been, a, you know, been able to be more prepared to have an empowerment mentality within their organizations. In some cases, they had multiple tiers of response, and, and they empowered the people to move to the different tiers as they sort of seen certain conditions, you know, uh, be taken on. The last thing I will share with you is, is where we're seeing most of the success is those organizations that have been predictive and were able to plan ahead for this period of time. We saw that in some of the organizations. We got early insight in terms of what was happening in China and what that potential impact would be here. But those that had put in a lot of the infrastructure had done a number of you know, various things around transformation, digitally transforming their organizations, having the right information, the data, understanding which suppliers were impacted, similar to the story that I mentioned about that Midwest you know, large global manufacturer. So we're seeing, and we do believe that we will have an evaluation as we come out of and get down to the backside of this, that we evaluate a lot of the things that we've done and understand as we've gone through this massive stress test of our organizations, you know, what has worked, what didn't work, and how do we bring much more agility into what we do on a go-forward basis? So, Matt, let me turn it back over to you, and maybe we have a few questions. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, for those on the line here, we do have time for some questions, so now is the time to send those in if you have them. Uh, but I do want to point out that today we, we see from our perspective the concept of supply chain agility popping up more and more often. Uh, it's not, it's every day that I'm popping up LinkedIn now and I see a different supply chain agility based article posted by one of the thought leaders. And so the, your, your comments around supply chain agility seem very timely. We have our first question in for you here. You discussed the current gaps in the skill levels of procurement staff. Analytics and data savviness were at the top of the list. If you have a lean team that needs significant help in building these skills, how would you build their skill set? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, I think the first thing that we have to understand is that it, it's not a, a nice to have anymore. Um, it, it, it's, it's critical. And as we look at it, and some of the things I mentioned before is, you know, on those particular slides, you know, I was trying to show a, a flow and a sequence in terms of understanding that if we're going to digitally transform, you know, we need to get our data right. And if we're going to get our data right, we need people that can help us do that, but also engage with that data over time. And so the environment that we see today is really one that you know, as we move from the environment of the past where we may have had a person on our team that engaged with data, you know, maybe it was our spend analytics that we were doing and that person, you know, performed that work as, as we were category managers doing sourcing work, et cetera, we would reach out to those individuals. What we're telling organizations today is that everybody has to be comfortable in engaging with data. We're not suggesting that everybody needs to be a data scientist, but what we are suggesting is you have to be comfortable understanding the data that you have to collect, the data that you have to engage with, and ultimately 
your comfort in telling a story about the data. And so in doing that, the question that you asked, Matt, is how do we do that? And I think, you know, one of the first things that we're seeing, and I, I, I like to say there's certainly training out there. There's probably a, there's a lot of different, you know, you know, ways to go out there to, to, you know, you know, bring some comfort and do some training in terms of analytics and engaging with data. There's a lot of online types of programs that, you know, you know, teams can take advantage of um, in developing that type of skill. And I don't think it has to be specific to procurement. I think some basic, you know, engaging with data type of skills. But at the same time, you know, I think if you can bring in some case studies in terms of how it applies in terms of the type of data that we use in supply uh, would be very critical in terms of developing those types of skills. So I think some of that training. But more than that, I think over time, you know, as I look at a lot of different training programs, it's not about just giving people and training them. It's then creating an environment where they have to use those skills that they just created and that you have to, you know, create an environment where, you know, you take away and you cut the umbilical cord in terms of, you know, having to be able to reach out where people are now forced to be able to engage with data. This is the only way that people are going to get better. I'd also create an environment that if people, you know, start to engage with data and, and there's a lot of tools out there. I mean, there's a lot of tools that people are using to visualize the data. Um, you know, Tableau is, you know, one of the ones we see popping up to just to, to create visualization, you know, that are very easy to use. And so if people are starting to get more comfortable with that, um, you know, with some of these easier to use tools, they're going to gain more insights. You're going to become more valuable to the stakeholders as you go tell the stories and what it really means to those stakeholders about the data. But I also encourage you to create, you know, environments where you collaborate. If there are things that you're doing with your data that are interesting, don't keep it a secret, you know, create cross-functional, you know, sharing platforms to let some of your peers know what are some of the things that you're doing that are unique because it may apply in their environment as well. Great. Thanks, Chris. You, you have been flooded with questions, so we'll get to the ones that we can. Uh, I think that this is a pretty good one for you. Many companies tend to utilize the 80-20 rule when it comes to suppliers. How do you see that fitting in the current procurement climate or how does a company get back to normal after a supply chain crisis like this pandemic? Yeah, it's it's a really good question. You know, and I, and I, I think when people look at the 80-20 rule, I mean, it depends on how you're splitting your data up. But typically when people look at the 80-20 rule, you know, it's 20% of the suppliers make up 80% of your spend. You know, when you're looking at supply chain, um, you really have to look at, you know, especially if you're trying to, assure your ability to create revenue, to deliver to, to your customers, et cetera, you're going to have to look at suppliers that may, be, may fall out of the 80-20 rule. Suppliers that are critical for the functioning and, you know, of your supply chain. And, and so in that particular case, you know, I would be looking at more from a risk standpoint, you know, where do I have the greatest risk? As I think about, and again, if I, if I use an example in the uh, med device or some of these companies that are very focused on the vac, you know, the vaccine or you know different treatments, uh, different devices, you know, to really help in the current pandemic. You know, what we're seeing is, you know, uh, you know, a very much of a focus of repositioning their resources in those particular areas. And so, as you look at those particular suppliers, you know, what are you doing to ensure that they have everything they need to do um, or have to be able to deliver to you? And those suppliers that are part of that you know, critical supply chain that you've identified uh, may not fall in your 80-20, um, you know, I mean, because it's really starting to look at criticality. And again, the reason I'm saying is that most people, when they do 80-20, they're really looking at it from a spend standpoint of the amount of spend. And what I'm suggesting is that not all the suppliers that are critical to the ongoing operations of your supply chain or, you know, another type of, you know, part of your business are necessarily going to fall in that you know, that 20% of the suppliers that make up the top 80% of your spend. Great. We have another one here that I think is very top of mind. And so this is with regard to cross-functional ownership of data, who else should be taking ownership as well as procurement? Well, I think uh, when you think about cross-ownership of data, I, I think you have to look at two things. One is the source of the data. So wherever that data is coming from, you know, and, and people who are putting the data in there, um, has to take ownership of the data, you know, and that, that may include, you know, your suppliers, you know, so you may have an env environment where suppliers are updating some of their own uh, data 
you know, in their, in, in the vendor master. And so, you know, that, you know, you're going to have, in, you know, you know, functions within the company that will have to take uh, ownership uh, and responsibility for it, but also potentially externally as well. But as you look internally, um, you really have to look at, you know, who should take ownership, who's responsible for the source of the data. So where is that data going to come from? So if we're collecting vendor data, where's that data coming from? Obviously from the vendors, potentially accounts payable, procurement, et cetera. But at the same time, I think the other owners have to be considered are the ones that are going to receive that data and get engaged with that data. You know, so if that data is, you know, if we have vendor data, who's going to be most impacted by having, you know, good vendor data? Um, so, you know, to me, the individuals that need to be involved have to be those those individuals and functions or you know parts of the business they're going to be either you know the source of the data or engaging with the data later on where it's going to impact you know their day-to-day -day operations is critical to them so I, I think we have time for two questions left so we definitely won't get to all of them on the line today uh, the first question that we'll ask you Chris is we have already started a transformation project. However, we have not focused on backward facing data to this point, thinking our new solution will capture what we need going forward. Are we set up for trouble and should we adjust our thinking mid transformation? Um, interesting question, because I, I think as you, as you look at this, you know, you think about backwards data and, and the question of, are you set up for success? I think the question is asking is, if I don't have good backwards data or good data coming in this digital transformation, am I set up for success? That's what I've been trying to say through the entire discussion is that the answer is no. Um, data is critical. It's foundational. And, you know, as, as you look at any digital transformation model, you know, Hackett as a company, we put out a, you know, a digital transformation model, you know, probably four or five years ago. And, you know, one of the things that we highlighted on there was the foundation. It was a horizontal uh, bar on it that had the foundation and data. And above that was the foundation around being able to engage with that data with analytics. But on top of that model from a digital transformation was a number of different pillars, things that impact, you know, things such as, you know, the ecosystem. If you're gonna create a, a digital ecosystem, what are all the different players that need to be part of this and how we're gonna engage? How are we going to engage digitally more internally across our teams? How are we going to engage more digitally, you know, externally with our suppliers? But all, this is where all the digital technologies come into play in terms of how are we going to create that digital framework? But it all rests on top of this data and, and an analytics capability to engage with that data to be successful. So, you know, if that data is incorrect, uh, sort of like going back to Steph's comment, you know, last week is that you're building a house on a shaky foundation. You need solid data, accurate data to build a good digital framework and drive a transformation of the organization. Thanks, Chris. So we'll have the last question here uh, in this uh, one says, I represent a think tank from time to time that collects data via face-to-face -face interviews via tablets. Currently, it is impossible. Can you please recommend a software that enables data collection easily? Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> well, I do a lot of that myself. I, I, I sit here and actually, while I've, I've been talking, I, I have my iPad in front of me. And in you know, one of the ways I, you know, in the business that I'm in, I do collect a lot of data um to bring that together you know and and you know the key thing is as you think about you know you know bringing all that data together if you're collecting you're doing interviews and you're pulling that together and one of the things that i do is i i, I have a tool that i use on my computer it's called pen ultimate as part of uh, evernote um, that i use to take notes and the reason is is i didn't want to type and i wanted to be able to write so i use my apple uh ipad and my apple pen uh, to be able to do that the challenge with that is that I can't share that with anybody else. So one of the things that you know we do as a team is we also use some of the Microsoft project or products, you know, like OneNote as a way to, you know, because you're going to have data coming in from lots of different ways. Um, sometimes that's going to be handwritten, uh, but the idea is how do we get that that is shared with everybody? I'll give you an example right now. Is I mean we as a team, you know, and I shared some insights 
uh, that we're collecting from the external environment in terms of what we're seeing companies do. And, and we're consolidating this and we're putting it out to clients. But we use that and we use our you know, OneNote, both you know, written as well as other types of notes to collect all of these insights in a very structured way that it can be shared amongst the team, but also can be utilized to be able to share you know, with organizations outside of Hackett, our company as well. Uh, so those are some of the processes that we're using. And I, I hope that answers your question, but uh, you know, that's how, you know, that's how we're, we're, we're doing it. And uh, that would be some of my suggestions. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Chris. It was very much appreciated. And I think based on the comments, everybody on the line got a lot of value out of it. For those of you that don't know on the line very soon here, this uh, will be known as Dr. Chris Sawchuk. So we, we look forward to him completing his doctorate here shortly. Next week, we have Dr. Eloise Epstein from AT Kearney that, who will speak uh, on April 8th. And just for everyone on the line that's been asking, the webinars will be posted on our YouTube channel the week after they go live. So if you go onto our YouTube channel right now, you'll see Stephanie's from last week, and then next week you will see Chris's. Thank you everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you next week.